Good morning. I'm going to call this meeting to order. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Treaty 1 territory and the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. My name is Marla Billinghurst. I will be chairing the panel this morning. To my left is Mr. Maurice Therrien, and to my far left is Mr. Robert Phillip. The assessor this morning is Mr. Rob Lucky, and our recording secretary is Ms. Katie Sutherland. We will be hearing applications for revision of the assessment role in accordance with the Municipal Assessment Act. The matters for which revision is requested have been described in each application, and we will limit discussion to those matters. The statements that applicants or the, ex or the assessor make at this hearing are sworn testimony, and anyone speaking to the matters must be sworn in. Be advised that comparisons of assessments of properties are not considered evidence of market value by the Board of Revision. The Board of Revision is appointed annually by Council and is independent of it and the City Administration. It makes its decisions on the basis of the evidence provided at this hearing and issues a written order that will be mailed to all parties as soon as possible. Please note that the Board's decisions with respect to an application may be appealed to the Manitoba Municipal Board if the matter pertains to assessed value or classification, or to the Court of Queen's Bench if the matter pertains to the application of exemptions from taxation. Should you wish to appeal, information on how to do so will be included with the Board's order. With respect to the hearing process, I will confirm the matters to be addressed with each applicant following the swearing-in. We will then have the assessor's testimony, followed by questions that the other applicant may have, and then the applicant's testimony followed by questions. Each side will have an opportunity to summarize if they wish. Once all the evidence about an application has been brought forward, the applicant may leave. The process will repeat for each item on the docket today. The session will close after all the applications have been heard, and the board will deliberate in private and make its decisions. You will receive the order by registered mail as soon as possible. As information, all public hearings are live streamed, recorded, and will be part of the public record. May I please ask everyone to turn off your cell phones? What you think I forgot to do. <laughs> Okay, the first matter on the docket this morning is 39 Weatherstone Place. <coughs> We've got file number 19-3153, roll number 0600765620. And what we have here is uh, 11 buildings. Um, they're built in 1970. There's 79 units. We have uh, page uh, two, there's no sales, all the returns are up to date. Page three, I there is like 50 permits dating back for quite a while. I put an example. There appears that there's uh, on quite a few units, there's kitchens and uh, interior upgrading uh, for the units. Um, and then on page four, I have an example picture. It's actually. Uh, This shows a three-story walk-up, and then the remainder are, are townhouses. I'm not sure how many are, or apart from, I think there's just the one building, I'm not sure. But uh, the remainder are townhouses, you know, so it's classified as uh, CMM R H, which is commercial row house. And on page six, uh, I have our uh, model workup. Um, 
so on page six, uh, a lot of this stuff will be similar, so I'll, I'll describe it now. And, uh, we have uh, two class codes, uh, 10 and 20. Uh, there's no differential between uh, the two. The 10 means four units or less. The 20 means more than four units. So the portioning, everything's exactly the same. It, it uh, doesn't have an effect uh, of one being higher assessed than the other uh, or portioned or anything. So like I said, we, we split them uh, with uh, the class codes and the two add up uh, with our, oh, and the other thing is uh, at the top, uh, it shows um, there's 24 two bedrooms, uh, which I assume are the apartments, and then 53 bedrooms, five four bedrooms. Um, the average monthly rent uh, includes uh, it, should, it, it could be said average monthly income. So it's the total income divided by the number of suites. It includes parking, laundry, anything, uh, any kind of income, not just rent. So um, we, uh, when you add the net operating income, our two together is 561,841. And that's substantially lower than the applicants. That's his evidence. Um, our mall cap rate for this building is 5.3, uh, which is um, is the cap rate up to 1974. So it's at the top end of the towards the top end of the 5.3 cap rate. Um, Anyway, uh, overall, uh, I would ask you to uh, maintain the assessment of 10601 which is just over $134 a unit. That's it. There's questions. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions for Mr. Luckey? Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so, and I think that was a question I had, Mr. Luckey, that so that 10 key, and I totally agree, it's got no, it's valued the same way, but it, there's multiple, I think you said there's 11 buildings on site, and so those are the assessments. Three that split out. Uh, the reason that that's split out is it's the uh, four units or less. That's why the 10 key is on some of those, a couple of those buildings, correct? Right. Okay. And this is model driven top to bottom? Um, most likely it, it could have been reviewed and, and uh, altered, I don't know. Um, but it, it, these are the model parameters. Okay, so we'll assume that it's model driven. Right. Now, um, with respect to the cap rate, the cap rate's 5.3. Uh, the commercial roll housing, if I recall correctly, in the previous cycle, the department had a separate cap rate for commercial roll housing of 6%, correct? Uh, that was the only uh, reassessment we tried. It right. It didn't work, but it was. Uh, okay. Um, Madam Chair, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Phillip? Yeah, I'm a little confused here on some of the numbers. Sure. Uh, is, it, is this just one building or two buildings? There's actually uh, 11 buildings. No, but I know there's 11 buildings. But there's of this, of this, of this particular There's, there's um, Is there two buildings here or one? Is this all the 79 units? Is it all in one building? Or is it in two buildings? That is spread. I'm assuming when I read this that there was two, two buildings. No, there's two different types of buildings. So the the 10T yeah. is the buildings, and there's a number of them uh, that are either four units or less. But it's still a so separate they're, building. They're all there's a whole bunch of there's 11 buildings altogether, and the buildings that are either four units or less are classified as 10T. That's a 
four units or less of classification. The 20T is the buildings that are more than four units. More than four units. Right. As, as it, like an apartment block or whatever, or a townhouse unit that has more than four units. So we got 79 units in total. Right. How many units are in 10T? I, I, what I did is, I, where I got confused, is I took the 1199.92 and I multiplied that by 79. Right. And it came to a different figure when you added the 979 and the 158. And so I didn't know how we arrived at the 979 and the 158. You add the gross potential rent of 979135 to 158389, you get 1,137,524. And if you divide that by 79 and divide that by 12, okay, this is where I made a mistake. Okay. okay. All right. You'll get 11.9992. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Whew, yeah, up. <laughs> <laughs> that was a I'm almost as surprised as you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, you apologize for that. No problem. Okay. Well, I have no other questions. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Tarion? Yes, uh, <clears throat> I've got a, a number, I guess. Um, now, the mailer on page 10, because I there's a number of mailers, but I'm sticking with the last one. I'm assuming covers both uh, 10 and 20, right? Both the uh, 10 and 20. Right, yeah, they don't, they don't distinguish. Okay, that's so way. that's the works. Yeah. So obviously you're, they've got a, a thinner mailer, they've got a 1 million 103, you're at 1 million 137. So you're about 34,000 higher. Um, in your uh, model. It's all model as far as you know? I think so. Yeah. Okay, now the other thing that um, I guess uh, stands out for me, your, your vacancy is at 2.60. And the vacancies over the years here are this year 603, the previous year 1106, the previous year 7.6, and the previous year 3.5. So, uh, did you take a look at these uh, mailers to try and, because it seems that the 260 seems quite low in relation to the history of what I read in the mailers. Okay. Uh, it does. Yeah. And obviously the vacancy is not deducted in their gross income on the mailer. So, uh, well, I, I don't know that. No, well, know what I'm looking at it here. And because they got a second page, okay, let's go to 11. Uh, first of all, you'll look at, at 10 and then you'll see 1103, 637 at the bottom of page 10. Oh, I see, you're right. And then on the next page, 11, I assume it's on the same year. They show vacancy at 70,192 and bad debts at 19. Okay. Rental income loss. Which page is that? That's, e that's 11. Page 11. Oh, you're okay. Gotcha. So I, I, I'm assuming that this is the income and this has not been taken off that income yet, which. Uh, would then we come to the uh, uh, differences in, in, in effect of the EGI. Right. Okay. I, I'm just raising this. This was not looked at or adjusted to take into account what we see in the mailers here. Um, well, it's one part of it. 
the, yeah. uh, there's, there's a big difference in expense. So we look at the bottom line. And not really like we, we don't like to make a lot of changes to the data that comes in. So we look if, if the net is close, then we're fine. And in this case, uh, the repair and maintenance is really high. They're putting in over 3,600 per unit. Okay. And there's some talk of capital work and there's permits and it's oh, yeah, so. it's pretty close to this. Yeah, I know, but that's no, that's not quite correct. Um, he was pointing out the NOI, but yeah. the NOI here is of two. So the NOI on the, your um, page six is five hundred sixty-one thousand versus the uh, four eighty-four, four forty-four on the page ten. So there's 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 a substantial difference. We'll have to see what the appellant has to say about. Yeah, no, I'm saying that I think the difference is the repairing. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll we'll have to see that thirty-six hundred sure. is the big one, eh? Yeah. Okay. Um, because these two are combined here, understand? And that's only single. No, I know. I know. Um, that's not the one that had a fire, is it? There's another one that had a fire down the line there at some I stage. Th I think that was. No, I don't believe that. I, that, that was one of the walk-ups yeah. at the other end of something. Yeah. Well, it's at the. It was in that area, though. It was yeah. in that area, yeah. But it was yeah. at yeah. the other side of South Hill. Okay. This is at the beginning of South Hill, the picture if you're heading east. Yeah. And these are masonry construction? Well, the... Uh, well, that's what it says here. The the, uh, the apartment building would be, be masonry and the townhouses would be wood frame. Okay. And Good actually on page five, I should show you that, um, like... Uh, where the dot is, that this this is the project, the complex, and uh, to the right is Lakewood. So you're at the very east side of uh, Southdale, and I'm pretty sure the building you're talking about is at the very on the other side, the east side along the. Yeah, you think so? It's not to say there hasn't been fires in here. Well, I, and I think I think that's right. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. yeah, I drove and I looked at it. I remember. But I'm yeah, sure it's one of those walk-ups that that's okay. along the park for the oh. mint. Okay. So the sum is uh, masonry because your front page under item. Uh, yeah. If number said, uh, number Mason four. And number four is uh, is the apartment building, and that would be masonry. Okay. And then if you look to the left side, there's called Mansard style townhouses. Okay. Those would be wood frame. Okay. So we said we we say when we say two and three stories, two story townhouse, three story apartment. Yeah. It's a bit of a hybrid to try and uh, Yeah, I, I understand but, but but you know when you look at, at uh, cap and everything, masonry obviously is is a more solid structure. Yeah. I think that's all for now. Thank you. Uh, the three-story apartment that is walk-up as well. Is I it, so. kind of a. Is it, I just didn't know if it was accessible if there were elevators or not because it is. No, it, it, there's a basement. Okay. And then you go up one and a half floors, down half a floor, kind of like a bi-level, and then one story on top. You've inspected this park? I've never been in the building. I've been by it a lot. Okay. Thank you. Please proceed. Thanks, Madam Chair. So uh, there's going to be a recurring theme in the, uh, the appeals this morning. For the most part, I think with one exception, the issue that uh, is represents the major difference in our approaches is cap rate. Uh, you, what the board will see this morning, if for again, I think with one exception, is the NOI that we calculate is actually either higher than the model-driven NOI or very similar to it. So what I suggest, uh, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll go through this information, the cap rate in detail for the first hearing, and then ask that that be carried forward. That Absolutely. Makes sense? Thank you. Okay. So if we could, please, uh, board members and Mr. Lucky, turn to our page eight of our materials. 
And a couple of things. Uh, oh, yeah, the main brief. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the um, uh, two Mr. Uh, Therian's comments, actually, if you, if you have Mr. Lucky's brief at page 10 over 10 and 11, which was the, were the pages of the INE that, that Mr. Therian was looking at, uh, our information, our understanding, Madam Chair, is actually that and you'll see this on our page eight, the potential gross income for 2017 is actually 1,183,816. And that is, what we're treating is on, on the um, owner's questionnaire on line 122, we are actually treating that as net of the vacancy reported on page 11. So uh, just to clarify that, that that's, uh, Mr. Therian, you thought that the vacancy and the bad debts would need to be deducted off that number yet? I don't believe that's the case. That's certainly not the way we value it. That's not our understanding with uh, the uh, reporting that, that this particular client provides. So what you'll see on our page 8 now of our, our, the text of our brief is the total potential gross uh, rent on line 3 that we have is actually 1,183,816 and that is, as you can see there, about uh, about $45,000 higher than the departments. And when you skip down after taking out the vacancy, uh, but then adding in the laundry and the parking revenue, then our effective gross income on line 13 is 1,114,834, which is very, very consistent with the department's EGI of 1,107,948. So we're very close there. Now, when you move down, however, to the, <coughs> pardon me, to the expenses, our stabilized expenses uh, actually, specifically looking at repair and maintenance on line 27, we've stabilized uh, the repair and maintenance at uh, just over $2,200 a door for a total expense, uh, stabilized expense item of 175000 That, of course, is significantly lower than uh, the actuals in 17 and 16, but uh, we believe that's, as a, as a stabilized amount, that would be an appropriate amount to uh, include in an evaluation and that then, with that and the remaining expenses shown there, the total expenses that we calculate are 504696 So that's actually about $40,000 less than the department's model-driven expense ratio. Uh, so our NOI, at the end of all that, our NOI under line 33 is 610138 is That is uh, roughly $50,000 higher than the department's NOI of 561841. Hence my comments that uh, in this case, and we'll see this uh, to varying degrees in the, in the next cases, uh, the, um, uh, the debate really becomes a, a, a question of capitalization rate. So if I could ask the board members and Mr. Lucky then to refer to our capitalization rate study. And on page one of our study, the chart on page one provides the summary of the respective positions of the department and ourselves. What we will be looking at this morning as far as the age categories falls into, if you see our age category is sort of in, in blue, our age category for these buildings will be in the 1960 to 1979 range where we are suggesting a 6% cap rate. So with that 6% rate, um, and you'll see it applied to our NOI, results in, in uh, indicated reduction for this property and the other ones on the docket this morning. So the 6% rate, and I'm going to move right through, I won't, I won't go through the summary charts, I'll leave that for, for the board to consider if they wish to do so, but on page 3 of our study then, these are the properties that we had, where we had the information that we included in our capitalization rate study. So as you can see, there's a number of properties, the oldest being 210 St. Mary's, a 1952 build, uh, where the cap rate was 6.26% all the way through to the newest property, which is a, uh, at 100 Southview, built in 2014, so a very new property with an indicated rate of 5.59%. Our average cap rate for all the properties is 5.91%. Uh, predictably, for the newer buildings, 2006 and newer, the cap rate is 5.38%, and for the, the average cap rate for those buildings in the 1966 to 74 vintage is 6.15%. So, the capitalization rate conclusions that we've come to, again, on the summary on the uh, bottom of the page, are based upon the data that we've listed on this page and uh, sort of with our age bracketing, the way that we've, we've, uh, we have it for the 20. 2020 cycle. 
So uh, as you can see, and I'll go through these, each of these properties um, individually, 210 St. Mary's Road, if we turn to page 6, the performance for each of the properties are attached, and, and so we'll, I'm going to go through all the details, but I'll go through it briefly. Uh, on page 6, this is the um, uh, sale of, of 210 St. Mary's Road, it's a much smaller building, there's 11 suites in total, 9 one bedrooms, 2, or, yeah, nine one bedrooms, two, two bedrooms. And as you can see, the potential uh, market rent there was 78,845. That's only 597 a suite, so it's a very, very low uh, rent per suite compared to the subjects. Subjects, of course, being much larger suites. And then working it through with the uh, expense ratio of 34.2%, we end up on 133 with a projected NOI of 51,922 for an indicated cap rate of 6.26% for, uh, for this property. Now, this property is 52, it's an older property. Uh, then the subject and also significantly smaller. Uh, 403 St. Anne's Road on page 7. Here we've got uh, a property that's a little larger, not much. It's 14 suites in total. The potential gross rent we have on line 3 is 139063 which uh, averages at $828 a suite. Then when we um, look at the total expenses of 50551 on line 31, that results in an indicated NOI of 90,119 and an indicated cap rate of 5.94% for this property. Uh, vintage is similar to the subject, uh, it's obviously a much smaller building. Page 8, 155 Mighty, again a 1968 build, 12 suites. And uh, here we had information that was uh, provided through our appraisal group, and uh, that would indicate a potential gross rent on line 3 of $907 average per suite, $130,560. And NOI on line 33 of 82608 after deducting the stabilized expenses of $45,994, and that indicates a cap rate of 6.05%. On page 9, we have uh, 512 Balmoral. So this is a very similar vintage, 1972, and a somewhat larger um, building. There's 28 suites in this case. Uh, predominantly one-bedroom suites. The potential rent on line three is 190606 for an average of 567 a suite, again, very much lower than the subject. Um, and the expense ratio we calculate is 39.1%, as shown on, on line 32. The total expenses of 75879. So our NOI on line 33, stabilized NOI is 118125 for an indicated cap rate of 6.75%. Then we go to uh, page 10, 215 La Verandre, similar vintage 1973, but again a smaller building, six suites. The potential gross rent is $89,228 uh, for 12, an average of $1,241 a suite. The uh, stabilized expenses we calculate is $20,265 for an NOI of 67859 and a cap rate of 5.9% in this case. On page 11, we've got a 1974 uh, building at 277 Langside, a bit of a larger building at 47 suites. Here again, we've got um, a potential rent of 312604 for an average of 554 a suite, and a stabilized expenses of 140139 for an NOI, stabilized NOI calculation of 183643 and an indicated cap of 6.12%. Then moving on to uh, the next page, page 12, triple three words. So these are the newer buildings now, uh, significantly newer than the subject. 2006 building, much larger building, uh, 103 suites in this case, mostly two bedroom with just a couple of three bedroom. The potential gross rent, uh, market rent there is on line three is 1,605,156 for an average uh, suite income of 1,299 per suite, um, significantly higher than the previous properties and more comparable on a per suite basis to the subject. And the stabilized expenses are 715870 a stabilized expense ratio of 43.7%, and uh, an indicated cap rate of 5.13% for this newer building. Page 13, we've got uh, another new building built in 2014, small building at 718 Beach Avenue. This is uh, a total of six suites, so very much smaller. Uh, total potential market uh, gross rent of 88200 which is 12, uh, average of 1225 a suite. Stabilized expenses at 28434 for an NOI of 58035 and an indicated cap of 5.42% uh, for this newer property. And then finally, at uh, 100 Southview, page 14, again, this is a 2014 build, a new property, very large, 148 suites, 
we've got potential gross rent there of $1,626 per suite on average for $2,888,256. And uh, expenses of 755, 357 stabilized for an NOI of 2,124 and a cap rate, indicated cap rate of 5.59%. So as you can see, the, the newer properties obviously do command uh, somewhat of a premium on the cap rates, as you would expect they would. The, the operating costs are, uh, of course, going to be significantly lower for the properties of, of that vintage, and um, and are also reflected in that in the. The, the quality in the newer age certainly reflected in the, the rents that are being generated by those properties. So turning back to page three on our chart, um, with our the, the vintage that we are uh, in the 19, late 60s, early 70s uh, vintage buildings, we're sort of suggesting the 6% rate would be appropriate based on our capitalization rate uh, data. So then with that in mind, when we turn back now to our evidence in chief on page eight, what you'll see, Madam Chair, is our higher net operating income on line 33 of 610,000 capitalized at 6%, uh, resulting in a, an indicated suggested value of 10,169,000, and that is our request uh, this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lucky, do you have questions for Mr. Lorimer? I do. said uh, your MOI is higher than ours. Yes. Uh, I would ask uh, state specific that would be the number. But um, your cap rate properties, and I hear I summarize them, uh, your um, average R&M for all your cap rate sales is 629 and uh, the properties we and th this will be for all of them. This is the basic cap rate argument for discussion. Um, yet, for all the uh, properties that are here today, you've stabilized them on average of over $2,000 a unit. Yes, indeed. Is it fair and consistent to uh, use low RM for your cap rate sales? Let's, let's go through that. Um, I anticipated the question that's come up before, so I'd like to go through this in some detail. I do not in any way dispute this chart. It's absolutely right. So let's discuss this. Uh, Mr. Lucky, if I could ask you initially to refer, uh, to move in, Madam Chair, for the board members to go back to our page six. I'll go through this in each individual case. Page six. Page six of the cap rate study. Yes. So the repairs and maintenance are going to be a function of three major considerations. The first and foremost, what kind of income the property is generating. Because if the property is generating a, a very low income relative to the subject, which a lot of these are, there simply isn't enough money to put in the same level of R&M. They're not trying to attract the same people when you're talking about a, a, an average rent of 500 or 600 bucks or, or even less. You're not trying to attract the same clientele who are going to pay $1,100, $1,200, $1,300, $100 per suite. Completely different model. So, for instance, on page 6 at 210 St. Mary's Road, um, Mr. Lucky is exactly right. As you see on line 27, the repair and maintenance there is $332 a suite. If you look on our line 3, the potential gross rent is $597 per suite. It's roughly half of, this, of the uh, rent uh, being generated by the subject. So we're trying, and, and Mr. Lucky, your question is a good one, we're trying to go on a site-specific basis uh, as best we can, and yes, this is a much lower revenue per suite, and that's reflecting the fact that the, the gross income or the income being generated by the property is roughly half of the subject. So if we then go to the next page, page 7, 403 St. Anne's, and again, the... Um, so here, the repairs and maintenance on line 27, it's based on the uh, three-year average of $14,036, which is just over $1,000 a door. Again, when you look at the potential rent, um, the potential rent is $828 a suite. And in this case, significantly, if you look at the notes at the bottom of page 7, this was a rehab before the sale. 
So this was rehab two years before the sale of windows, kitchen cabinets, countertops, appliances, fixtures, flooring, hallways, uh, roof, uh, roof and boiler not upgraded, but all of those upgrades. So when you've got a, a, a property that's had significant upgrades throughout the suites, you would expect a lower repair and maintenance item. So as, as between that work that had previously been done prior to the sale and the lower uh, gross income, uh, the thousand dollars per suite makes sense. Now, if you look at 155 Mighton again, uh, the, our uh, information here on page eight, our information is limited. But what we do know is that we, it was renovated in 2011 and 12, and was given a five-year rent exemption from CMHC uh, or CMHC, the residential tenancy rent. So, with that renovation uh, in mind, the, the stabilized amount per door is $750 per suite. That, and, and here's where I have less information than I would prefer, but I'm assuming that is a function of two things. The fact it was renovated, but also the uh, revenue, if you look at on our line three, the revenue per door is $907 uh, per door. Again, so significantly lower than the subject. So for 512 Belmoral, where Mr. Uh, Lucky correctly has the average uh, repair and maintenance per suite of 12094 uh, which is 432 per suite, that, I'm going to suggest very strongly, if you look at our line three on that page, the potential income, average income per suite is 567000 less than half of the subject, and that's going to be reflected in what's a sustainable, lower, much lower R&M per door for that property. Um, moving ahead to 215 La Verandre, um, here, what, what we were advised is that the actual R&M that's shown, they did include some CapEx, so we did stabilize it lower. Um, and in this case, the the, um, uh, the $500 per door is based on an assumption that the amounts shown on line 27 included significant amounts of capital expenditures, and therefore we had it at the lower rate. This one, though, in fairness, this one has the higher suite income of $1,241 uh, per door, so that is very comparable to the subject, but the uh, removal of the CapEx resulted in the decision to put the lower uh, $3,000 stabilized amount in there. Then moving to page 11, and again, this is uh, on land side, a similar vintage, and where the average repair and maintenance per door is $469, but again, if you go to uh, line three, the revenue per door is less than half of the subject at $554, and so for the reasons we're talking about, to have a higher repair and maintenance and uh, just is not sustainable for these kind of properties. Then we get into the newer properties on pages 12, 13, and 14. As one would expect, the repairs and maintenance per door would and should be much lower than the subject with the 70s vintage. The rents are also a lot higher uh, than the previous properties in our cap rate study. So they're in that 1200 to, they're all, yeah, they're in the 1200 to $1,300 range for Ward and Beach, and then a lot higher for Southfield, almost six, over $1,600 a door. So those are much newer, and you would expect the repairs and maintenance to be a lot lower. So Mr. Lucky, your question is a good one. But when you've got properties, if, when you're trying to attract and retain tenants uh, in suites like this one with the 70s vintage, it requires a much higher degree of repairs and maintenance year in and year out to both attract them and retain them uh, when you're charging the $1,200, $1,300, $1 dollars rent per door. And therefore, if you recall, we had stabilized our repair and maintenance much lower than the actuals, and we believe we're being very fair and consistent between that stabilized income and the stabilization we've done in our cap rate study. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> for the subject property, do you have a breakdown of the repair and maintenance? A detailed breakdown? No. What the owner has, has submitted, and this. So, we don't know what's capital. Yeah, actually, we do. Okay. So, um, if we go to. Our page 17, this is the very same questionnaire. Sorry, which document? The, oh, the evidence, or my evidence. Oh, okay, thank you. It's the same questionnaire that Mr. Lucky had submitted, but uh, we've also got it in our materials on page 17. Okay. So the repairs and maintenance, now I'm, I'm going to qualify this. If you recall, Madam Chair, if you look on page 17 and line 212, mm -hmm. the actual repair and maintenance was in this year was $286,000. And I'm, to be clear, I'm in agreement with Mr. Lucky. That's what was it, 3,600 a door or 3,400 a door or something? That's too high. That I don't believe would be required here in Europe, which is why we stabilized it at 175,000. But this is, and this is one of only a few clients I'm aware of that takes the time to split out repair, what they consider repair maintenance and capital. 
So line 212 is 296,000. If you go to page 18, there is a separate uh, section in the questionnaire for capital costs. And they, this client, um, and you'll see it throughout the properties this morning for the same client, they take the time to list in the capital section what they consider to be capital improvements. And in this case, they've got uh, kitchens and buildings of 39,467. So, um, Mr. Lucky, I guess my point is, this client actually takes the time to split out what they consider capital. I do not have the details of the 285000 I do agree that is not an expense one would stabilize at year in and year out. Um, but we have already made an assumption of, of a much lower number, notwithstanding that the client reports capital items separately in this case. So again, um, on page 10, which is uh, 215 level under so <coughs> of, of your cap, quote, yes. the average r and is 2210, and you're saying that most of that is capital, so it was reduced to $500 r and In that particular case, that's, that's the decision that was made. In that particular case, yes. But don't forget all the other ones, uh, Mr. Mr. Lucky. We're taking averages. <coughs> so it's based on a site-specific analysis, based on the best information we have. If we look at the other point you made, was the subject's assessment at Murray. Well, I'm looking at uh, page, um, I think it's three of the cap rate study, the office cap rate study, and it shows the, ch the chart, right? The chart summary of all the cap rate elements. based on the physical characteristics, but what we're trying to do, uh, Madam Chair, is get a sense of what the rates of return are for multifamily properties and then trying to determine from that a rate of return that would be expected for the subject. So uh, 277 Langside is a similar vintage. It's got 47 suites, so it's not as big as the subject, uh, but certainly, um, you know, it's, it's larger. It's not like a six-suite or ten-suite building. And I, so... I had asked one question on Mr. Lackey earlier about the department's earlier 6% rate for uh, commercial rural houses. I understand they've taken that away, you know, no dispute on that. But I'm going to suggest there's a reason for it when we've got these commercial rural housing with all kinds of, you know, in this case, I believe 11 buildings spread out. That actually, in my respectful submission, would present a higher risk when you've got, because now you've got. 11 different building envelopes, 11 different groups. You've got, you've got a higher level of ongoing maintenance and therefore your ongoing erosion to the to the income relative to the buildings that are all under one, you know, sort of under one roof. Um, but but you're right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lucky, when you look, so for instance, at the La Verandre property, it's, it's only six weeks. It's not the same. It's the same vintage, but it's not the same animal as we have here. 
but the rates of return that are indicated are consistently in the upper five to low sixes, and we believe that provides a good indicator for the subject based on the rates of return that investors seem to want. But you said the most comparable would be 277 Langside and 512 Balmora. How would those locations compare to Southdale? Oh, the location, the Southdale location is superior, and we're not asking for either 6.75% or 6.12%. We're suggesting 6%. So I don't dispute that. I agree the location here is better. Thank you very much. Mr. Phillip, do you have any questions for Mr. Reimer about his evidence? No. Okay. Quite a bit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Terry, any questions for Mr. Reimer? No. Quite interesting. The difficulty I always have is when there is, I know that's a 1970 building, so I would take that into account. However, when you look at what they're spending on maintenance and so on, it obviously really keeps up the value of the building. Absolutely. So that's always a dilemma that we have to face. And I'm going to redirect to the city after, but the Hollier's on page 86, multifamily, and I know there's all kinds of arguments raised on that, are between five and six on low rise. Yes. So they're in that range. And the CBRE report on page 90 is also, but they're more at 575 to six for low rise. Okay. So obviously we're in the, it's in the range that you're after, but you're using the higher. But obviously they've always got arguments of what's in there and what isn't. For these, maybe you can comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. So the reports that the commercial brokerage firms generate will be based on, for lack of a better term, the top shelf assets. That's what they're really tracking. And the method, whatever methodology they may have used to calculate those rates, I don't know what they are, but I, without having had the details of how they got to the NOI and therefore the cap rate they did, I don't place a lot of weight on that. And neither am I asking the board to. But if you turn, and if you turn briefly to our page four of our cap rate study now, keep your hand on that page with the Collier's report. But in the Collier's, historically what Collier's has done when they calculate the cap rates on, for the purposes of these reports, is they include closing costs like land transfer tax and the premium that would be adjusted for what's included but not factored into the cap rates that are applied for assessment purposes, that would amount to about 0.1%. So the range, indicated range, is the 5.1% to 6.1%. But again, the, so we're within that range, Mr. Madam Chair and Mr. Tenorian, and agreed it would be at the upper end of that indicated range. But our suggestion is based on the specific data that we presented with very specific NOI calculations. And I'm asking that's where the weight should be put rather than, you know, the charts are there for the board's reference to show that we're consistent with and within the indicated rates being published. But we just don't know how those rates were calculated with any degree of accuracy whatsoever. So it's meant as a, it's not like we're asking for, you know, 7% and Collier's is saying the top end is 6, we're within the rate, and asking the board to place the weight based on the specific data that we presented this morning. I'd like to redirect the question to the city assessor. Sure. On your page 8, looking at your low-rise multifamily, I guess you're, are you using the 20th and 80th percentile chart, 490 to 530, because that would be the highest in that one, although you may argue that the 4 to 730 is the one that we have to look at. I just don't know. Could you, because you're using 530 for a 1970 building, so I'm, could you try and maybe help me a little bit on that? Thank you. 
Well, um, the, the complete range, including all areas, is four to seven point three. Um, the majority of the buildings in this age range of um, this seventy-four. Well, I think yeah, uh, it, it goes. I think uh, Altus has got this laid out on their page two. Page um, one, they're sure where the city's at. I think assessor Capri, sixty to seventy-four between four point six and five point three. Correct. Um, and, and it, it also includes, okay, no, but it also it goes from 46 to 74. It also does? Right. So 46 to 59 is yeah, 4.6 okay. to 5.3. Yeah, you're, you're right. And 60 to 74. So it goes, yeah, it, uh, it would be a higher rate for pre-46. So we're yeah. at the top end of the 46 yeah. to in, 74. In, in 75... You would be five. up to five. Right. Yeah. It might, I'm not sure, we might see a five today. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, actually, we will see a five. Okay, that's all on my own chair. So the, the ones that are lower are small buildings, uh, like uh, six, eight suite buildings are the ones that you see going into the floors. Thank you. Yeah, I have thank no you. questions for Mr. Reimer at this time. However, uh, were there any questions for Mr. Lucky about his rebuttal evidence? No, <laughs> no absolutely not. He's, I think he's presented this fairly. Yeah. Did you cover that? Yeah. Mr. Phillips, did you have any questions? No, I don't. Mr. Terry? No, I'm okay. okay uh, nor did I. Okay. No, absolutely not. <laughs> I want to make sure I covered it. <laughs> yeah, fine. Are you, are you can rest assured if we have a question, we'll ask it. I know, I know. <laughs> I know you will. <laughs> okay, the next matter is 31 Weather Snow Place. Mr. Lucky, please proceed when you are ready. Okay, thank you. We have uh, file number 19-2714, and we have roll number 0600765-7200-31 Weatherstone Place, which is right next door to uh, the previous one. Uh, this building, uh, the, it's uh, seven buildings, and uh, we have uh, it built in 1970 and 1971. There's uh, 69 units. <coughs> Again, on page uh, two, there's no recent sales. I believe these people built it, and uh, they're all up to date on the returns. Uh, again, there was a lot of uh, renovation permits. Um, page four. Uh, Block noise, but uh, same kind of thing. We have uh, a combination of the uh, masonry walk up and then a bunch of townhouses. And um, on page five, the site plan <coughs> is um, next to 39, and it's behind, uh, there's a little strip mall there. I I think it used to be 7 11 or whatever I'm saying now. Actually, I think a lot of those offices are there. They're there, exactly. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah, I, met them, I met them there in the past. Um, so, page six. Uh, again, um, rather than going through it all, it's a Capri issue. Our NOI is. Uh, Significantly lower. And uh, I think that's all there is. Okay, thank you. 
Mr. Reimer, do you have any questions? So just, Mr. Rocky, as far as you know, this is just model written from top to bottom. I believe so. Okay. And Madam Chair, can I ask all of the questions and discussion on cap rate to be carried forward? Absolutely. Thank you. Those are my questions. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Gillick? No, I have no questions. Mr. Terry? Yeah, now that I've cheated and I've looked at this, <laughs> this present day, but I understand. No questions. Okay. Uh, nor do I, so please proceed with your presentation. Thanks, Madam Chair. Can I ask that Mr. Lucky's brief on page 6, actually it doesn't, it's, it's on our brief too, so page 8 of our uh, evidence and sheet, please. Yes. And so again, this is, in fact, Mr. Lucky's characterization is exactly right. Our NOI, as we show in line 33, is actually about, I guess that's about $36,000 higher than the department's NOI, so this does indeed come down to a cap rate suggestion. Our submission, our respectful submission is for 6% for all the reasons we discussed previously, and that results in an indicated value of 8694000 and uh, that is the uh, request we have this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Lucky, do you have questions for Mr. Reimer? Uh, no questions. Mr. Fillick? No, it just seems that the issue is the cap rate. Mr. Terry? No questions. Thank you. Nor do I. Okay. Yep. Okay, the next matter is 70 Baylor Avenue. So let me please proceed when you're ready. Uh, we have file number 19-2607, which is roll number 0304072410. This is another uh, Lodco property located at 70 Baylor Avenue in Fort Richmond. We have uh, 17 buildings. Um, the combination of very similar to the previous uh, townhouses and uh, apartment. And, uh, there is a mixed age of 1970 and 2008, and I looked it up, and 12-unit uh, building was uh, replaced in 2008. So one building is was new in 2008, the 12-unit building, and the rest uh, were built in 1970. So, uh, pages aren't numbered. Well, actually, uh, the site plan, I have it outlined, and we're um, along this uh, man made uh, lake drainage. Uh, these are the high rise buildings across the lake on Pamina, and then just to the north is the Fort Richmond Shopping Center. So, we're south and behind the Fort Richmond Shopping Center. And uh, picture again, uh, same uh, masonry apartment, uh, wood frame townhouses. And on page three, our, um, our work up uh, shows uh, Six one bedrooms, eighteen twos, fifty nine threes, and seven fours for a total of ninety minutes. And uh, our uh, our total NOI is five hundred fifty four thousand five hundred fifty one, which is about thirty odd thousand lower than the applicants. So I would ask that you maintain um, our assessment of 10463000 which is about 116000 a year for townhouses and apartments. 
point of view is in, in, well, actually, uh, after the uh, workup I have uh, showed that the uh, 2016 assessment was maintained at 10,915,000 and there was no appeal at 18. Thank you very much, Mr. Reimer. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Madam Chair. And again, Mr. Lucky, to the best of your knowledge, it's model driven top to bottom. Here. And uh, Madam Chair, questions asked and answered on every. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Phillip. No questions. Mr. Terrian. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. No questions. Nor do I, so. Oh, sorry, we can your coffee. What's better than drink your coffee? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, the panel members, Mr. Lucky, could again turn to our page eight of our evidence in chief, please. Uh, Mr. Lucky's characterized the issue exactly correctly. The, if you look, skip down to our line 33, our net operating income in this case is, in fact, $33,000 higher or so than the department's model-driven NOI. So the issue, again, involves around cap, and for the same reason we've talked about, we're asking for a 6% rate in this case, resulting in a suggested value of 9788000 and that's our request this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucky. Do you have questions, Mr. Ryan? Yeah. Mr. Phillip? No. Mr. Terry? Thank you. No. Uh, nor do I. Okay. Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. The next. There you go. Um, move it. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. <laughs> That's matters 30 Taylor Avenue. She's going to lose her job. I don't <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> Not with all the cutbacks. I don't want to. We have uh, file number 19 2605, roll number 030407. Two three two zero zero properties at thirty Baylor, which is next to seventy Baylor. Here we have um, uh, eight uh, buildings. Uh, looks like probably all townhouses. Nineteen seventy. There's seventy five suites. Uh, similar uh, mix of uh, apartment building and townhouses. Um, we have mo model parameters. Uh, right, so there is apartments. There's 12 one bedrooms, 24 two bedrooms, 34 trees and five four bedrooms. Um, we um, I used model parameters and I would ask that you accept the assessment of nine million three hundred and thirteen. Have uh, 2016 uh, assessment of 9,107 was confirmed by the board of revision. Okay. I think that's all I have. That's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Madam Chair. And, and you alluded to it, Mr. Lucky. It's model ribbon top to bottom, correct? Right. And uh, questions asked and answered, please, on cap. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Phillip. No question. Mr. Terran. Do you know if this has been appealed or not? If there's no note about appeal on the uh, previous uh, assessment. 
16th? Yeah. The 2018? Well, I'm not sure what it was. It was 16 old. was confirmed at 9,107. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's not my question. Was it appealed to the municipal board? Oh, he didn't say that. Well, I think he did. My note says MB. I don't know what that was. It may have been. Okay. Okay. We haven't dealt with 16 municipal boards yet, so I don't We're up to 16, we're getting, which is we're a good sign. Right? That's, that's terrible. terrible. We're cleaning up. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good thing. No, it's because you had it in your previous one, so I was aware. Oh, did I? Okay. Oh, yeah, you wrote on the previous one that there was no appeal. Okay. Thanks, Mayor. Yes, Go ahead. Okay. Uh, page 8, please, of our evidence. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, if you look at line 33, our NOI is actually about $30,000 less than the department's model-driven NOI. That can be, as you work back up through our evaluation, that is actually a function primarily of the higher vacancy allowance that we have applied to the subject. If you look at our line 3, the potential gross rent we have is actually just a touch higher than the, the department's model rent. Ours is a million twenty six five hundred versus the nine nine seven two eight one. But uh, the nine point nine percent vacancy rate that we've applied results then going down and even after adding back in laundry and miscellaneous income, that results in an effective gross income on line thirteen of nine thirty one uh, five sixty seven, which is uh, roughly forty, I guess forty-one thousand dollars less than the department's EGI. So that the difference primarily in, in this entire workup relates to the vacancy rate. As you can see, the vacancy rate was significantly elevated uh, in fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen. We've applied the seventeen rate of nine point nine percent at the lower and lowest end of the three years, and uh, then using that th that. Uh, parameter to value the subject or calculate the potential gross or effective gross for the subject, then with the expenses, our expenses are actually just a touch lower stabilized than the department's. We've got 467,793 versus the department's 479,762, and that results though, again, based on that vacancy allowance of a, an NOI calculation of 463,774, and our suggested cap rate for the reasons we discussed is 6% resulting in an indicated value of 7,730,000. And that is our request this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lucky, any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Billick? Well, it seems everything's here that I need. Mr. It's just a vacancy. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Are you done? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, what, what's the reason that you know on this, for this vacancy trend? If you, this area, and if you look back at the previous um, property beside it, the vacancy rate, and I asked the very same thing of, of the owner, this owner and the one from the previous are the same owner. Okay. Uh, and they, and I asked them if there was anything other than just the market demand that would result in higher vacancy, and I was told no, it was just a function of the properties not being as in high demand as they perhaps had been in previous years. So um, I know the vacancy was higher still going back sort of 2013 in that era, but it's come down a little bit, and so it's improving, and I think actually that is a function of them um, doing the things they need to do as far as upgrading some of the suites and, you know, put, putting in the investment to, to re-attract tenants into that area. So it's a market, it's a, it's a function of the market for these particular properties, but it's, you know, the, at least it was getting better by the end of 2017. Well, I'm not done. So, uh, the, um, I know that you tend to stabilize, but I, I've always got a, I guess a uh, problem on the snow re removal, you're sort of stuck by the weather uh, and you, you know, in, in 17 you were 26,000, you were charging only 19. Um, do you do this all the time? 
it, it is except so for things like s snow removal um, and things like uh, professional fees where it can fluctuate and just like you said because some years we can get well, yeah, that's 100 right. centimeters of snow and some years 10 yeah. so we will average it take some averages to represent a stabilized amount for these things that will fluctuate greatly for specific things and mr. lucky is, is very familiar this is for real estate taxes that's a very specific number we take the number from in this case 2017 uh, but for some other items, uh, like the snow removal, it's, it's based on averages where it can be very both up and down. Okay. The, the other uh, question I had was on the building. Is this a wood and concrete uh, combination? Do you I know? Think, yeah, it, I believe it is. Unless yeah. Mr. Lucky's got other information, I believe it's a combination of masonry and some wood frame buildings on that. Yeah, I think the apartments are masonry and the townhouses are Okay. Because uh, to me, it's you know the stability of a building is normally better under masonry, and it, right, I'm looking at caps when I'm looking at that. Okay. Yeah, it's a hybrid for sure. It's hard. To yeah, it's hard. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Well, when I was just looking at the repairs and maintenance, it looks like they have been making quite a bit of effort to spend a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. To repair the suites, do you know what they were doing with, with these repairs? That will be a function of refreshing them significantly. So it's going to be things like carpeting and and you know obviously new paint, uh, flooring, uh, flooring, uh, possibly some more extensive work in the kitchen. So yeah, that's a very good point, uh, Madam Chair, that Mr. Phillips making because if you look on our line 27, it dipped. So the the two previous numbers uh, at the, to the left of the columns that's 13 and 14. So it was at 200,000, then dipped to 136. But since then, uh, you know, they've been spending significant sums to try and get people back attracted to and into that building. And by 2017, certainly, it seems to have started to pay off. So I would agree with that. And uh, when you when you had an average of 259, yeah. you decided to use 150. But it was a regression. And, and, and that was anything. We've stabilized, if you look, uh, Mr. Priller, to the right, it says 2,000 per suite stabilized. So in our opinion, anything north of, uh, now these town commercial road housing, these types of properties are a little different. They're typically higher than average, but they're also bigger suites and lots of three bedrooms and such. But um, when you've got something that is exceeding 2,000 or perhaps at the very top end for these type, types of properties, $2,200 a door, when you go beyond that, it is not I believe a, a, an expense that would have to be stabilized and spent every each and every year. So I would not expect, for instance, and for 2017 it was a very high number, 288,000. I would not expect that an investor would say I have to keep spending 288,000 dollars per year, which is how many suites do we have here? 75. So so that's well over. In fact, that's approaching 4,000 dollars a suite. Mm -hmm. That is not a number that's sustainable under any circumstances, even with the good rents that they're getting. So I would expect that those suites that have had the $4,000 spent in them will look significantly better and different than the, you know, the ones that haven't. So that's why we're stabilizing at 150000 It results in an NOI on line 33 to 463000 That's obviously way higher than anything that was actually occurring, but it's based on a, on a stabilized number in the future, uh, based on 2000 a suite. Uh, you don't know how, how many suites are left to be repaired? I do not know. Okay. okay thank you. And I have no further questions. Thank you. So perhaps we'll take a break now. Okay, thank you, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting back to order. The next matter on the docket is 1321 Beaumont Street. Mr. Lucky, please proceed when you are ready. Thank you. File number 19-2711, roll number 03071085700, and this is a <coughs> townhouse property at 1321 Beaumont Street. Uh, the uh, owner is shown as Sam Properties Holding Inc., which is a non-profit group, I believe. Um, we have here um, two assessments. One is the uh, residential townhouse portion, and the other is an exempt daycare. Um, we're not, you know, 
we're not at odds on the daycare. It's exempt anyway. Um, so we have uh, these, as I said, the townhouses built in 1984. There's 72 units. This um, first page or the second page, I guess, is the uh, site plan, and this is the uh, Beaumont is. Uh, and McGilvery is just uh, west of uh, Pemina. Um, that's where it is. It's, it's uh, faces on McGilvery and Beaumont, uh, just uh, west of Pemina. And, um, Uh, the picture is, shows the townhouses, and I, I believe that building in the front is their office and daycare, which I said is exempt. Um, page two, um, uh, returns are received. Uh, we show a uh, December uh, 2013 sale of six million nine hundred thirty-four uh, consideration of dollar first form value six million nine hundred thirty-four. Um, I don't have any particulars on this yet. Um, the uh, page three, the. Uh, um, Suite breakdown is uh, 44 two bedrooms, 28 three bedrooms. Uh, we have a total average income uh, per unit of 900, almost 96 dollars. Um, so the, the apartment uh, income uh, breakdown is what we're concerned with. Not the re the retail is the daycare. Uh, these are. Uh, Model um, parameters. The uh, the income, uh, I believe, is uh, geared to income, uh, ability to pay. Um, so we use market uh, income, which we agree on. And um, our uh, this is a newer uh, building, 1984. So our cap rate for this is five. As I said before, anything newer than uh, 1975 and newer is, is a five cap. Um, page four is the comparables that we used. As I said, we agreed on. Uh, I didn't do the income approach. Thank you. Mr. Armour. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Lucky, uh, I'm being Madam Chair for board reference, no dispute on the, on the daycare portion. So, uh, on the apartment component, that's, uh, I think you alluded to it, it's model driven top to bottom, correct? Right. And, um, Madam Chair, if I could ask the cap rate question and answer, thank you. Absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> you were thinking, or oh yeah, no, sorry. Oh, sorry. that's it. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Philip. Any questions? I guess just for my uh, knowledge, when you say exempt, it means they pay no property tax. Right. Okay. Non-profit daycares don't pay tax. So the learning curve for me. For me? So learning curve for me. There you go. Okay. <laughs> If it was a for a profit daycare, yeah. Okay. Uh, Other questions? No, that's oh, it. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm okay so the daycare were okay on both sides. Right. Uh, we're only looking at the apartment right. at this point. Correct. Right. And this is. Uh, 
townhouses? Right. Thank you. You don't know anything about the sworn value of the of the sale you mentioned of sixty nine thirty four. No, I didn't uh, research it. Well, I never looked at the number here. These are populated. I don't put the sales in. Uh, so they got on the mailer subsidy, and although that's post to reference. December 31st, 2018, on page whatever. Oh, you're right. That would be a close reference. Uh, Madam Chair, I think actually that's the wrong date. If you look at the date it was signed, it was signed June 5th, 2018. I think they just meant to put 2017. Oh, you're right. Yeah, that is December yeah, right. 31st, 2017. Yeah. I Indeed. just took a quick glance at it. Should be. No, you were right. No, they put the wrong date. They, they put the wrong date on yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just give me a sec so I can, sure, thanks. I can look at the mailer. I always do. Absolutely. Um, so they've got subsidy vacancy. So I guess they've taken off the vacancy as the parking. So their total income is 760 versus your 860 or 839, I guess, because the vacancy is taken off of that. So uh, would that be a fair assessment of what the mailer has? 760 on income versus 839? The uh, the uh, this is a nonprofit, and the uh, income is uh, not necessarily it's skewed. It's skewed. So we use uh, we use market income, and, and oh, we have both I see. We, both sides agree on the income. So, okay, I haven't cheated. I haven't, we're both I haven't right looked at both the both other yet. Yeah. Okay. Because you're, they're not making any money. There are sixty-five thousand in the hole. That's a non-profit. Yeah, I know. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Okay, fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I have no questions. So please just go. Thanks, Madam Sorry. Chair. Um, if I could ask the board members and Mr. Lucky to turn to our page eight of our evidence sheet. And Mr. Lucky is exactly right. So this is a non-profit. Uh, this. Um, so the, based on the uh, department's applied effective gross income, we've applied that very same EGI. Uh, we agree that the, what's actually happening is a reflection of this, the fact that it's non-profit in the structure of this particular um, uh, development. So we're not applying the much lower figures shown on the on the statements. However, what's happening, if you look then down to our line 31, our total expenses are just about $26,000 higher than the department's model-driven expenses, whereas the model had kicked out a number of 425,864, we're suggesting 452,103. That includes a stabilized amount on line 27 of 110,537 for repairs and maintenance. But then there's also some items, not all, but some items out of the replacement reserve fund shown on line 29, and that represents the effectively the, the difference, I believe, in the respective expense calculations. So I want to go through that very briefly with the board members and Mr. Lucky so you have a sense of where we got our figures from. Uh, if I could ask the panel members, Mr. Lucky, to turn to page 31. So on page 31, this is the statement of the, the details of the replacement reserve fund and for our purposes, for evaluations, what we looked at, of course, within the fund, there's a certain amount of expenditures that are authorized uh, year in and year out. And we uh, always will look at what expenditures there relate to truly to capital and what expenditures relate to uh, ongoing repair and maintenance. And so for the 2017 year, what you'll see is about the middle of the page, the total expenditures out of the fund for the year were 77322 and what we took out of that as capital is the building envelope uh, expense of 25690 and the, uh, the water tank replacements of 6225 So the net um, repair and maintenance expense out of, and amongst the repairs and maintenance out of the reserve fund was 45407 for 2017. Similarly for 2016, the total expenditures were 74433 We took out the building envelope expense, 
uh, item of 30,660. We took out uh, hot water tanks replacements of 2565. So our net repair and maintenance amount was $41,208. And then finally, if one turns please to page 43. So this is the similar page relating to the uh, reserve fund and expenditure made. This is for the years 2015 and 2014. Page 43. Three. The last, last page. page. Oh, okay. Uh, so the expenditures, total expenditures for 2015 were 95,115, and what we took out of that amount was the sidewalk expense of 39,000. The roofing expense of $7,600 and the water tanks again of $10,099. So the net repair and maintenance indicator was $38,416. And then finally in 2014, we've also got those figures. A total of $67,528. We took out the roofing uh, of $8,115. We took out the water tanks of $12,578 to uh, come in at a net repair and maintenance expense of $46,800. So then, going back to our page three. These three year, and this is back to line 29. These three year average between 2015 and 2017 of, of the net um, items relating to repair and maintenance out of the, that reserve fund were 41,677, and that's what we've applied in our evaluation. So, using that and the other figures indicated there, the stabilized NOI that we arrive at is 387,535, capped in this case at 5.75%. Uh, I'll briefly refer to our study, but this is a newer building, so we're using the uh, lower rate to reflect the newer age of the property, coming in at a requested value of 6740000 And again, I, the NOI calculated obviously is much higher than the actual uh, NOI after uh, looking at the figures that were in place, but that again reflects a lower than market uh, potential income in our opinion, and we are in agreement with the assessor's uh, effective gross income in this case. So just briefly, I won't go through all the details again, but on our capitalization rate study on page one, there's the chart of our break points. And in the case of the 5.75%, the break points that we have applied are between 1980 and 1997. And this uh, property being, I think, an 84 build uh, certainly falls within that. And so we're asking for 5.75% in this case. And that is our presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lucky. Do you have questions for Mr. Reimer? Sure. Um, so, line item 16 professional fees at almost $11,000. Um, you know what, what kind of, like uh, your other privately owned townhouses were around $2,000 professional fees. Um, do you know what the comprises of the this well, this four thousand one year and eighteen thousand yeah. year? year? Eighteen thousand seems high. Four thousand actually seems low. I think so. Uh, this is you've identified, Mr. Mr. Lucky, and you're right. This is an NPO, a nonprofit organization, and of course they get there. There's the structure of the uh, of the units is uh, there's there's government involvement. And so between the government involvement and specifically um, all the auditing requirements that they have because of this structure of, of the way this organization is, it results in higher than, uh, I guess, higher professional fees than if you were simply a private company who didn't have those same reporting and auditing requirements. Uh, so I believe that's, again, I'm agreeing with you, 18,000 seems excessive. I believe the 10,800 is probably in, in within a reasonable range for this particular NPO because of all those requirements. But it is higher than private industry in most cases, yeah. So then um, the replacement reserve yes. line 29. Yes. Um, so this is a capital replacement fund that they are forced to pay a certain percent each year into, is that? that that's exactly right. So they put the money, a certain proportion of the money into this fund so that they can basically for the either major capital expenditures or to make sure that the ongoing work that's required to keep the property in a reasonable state 
that the money is there to lend to you. It's normally called capital replacement for the year. Mm -hmm. Well, but that's misleading. I suggest, Mr. Lucky, because well, some of it, some of it's capital projects. A lot of it is repair and maintenance. But if yes, if, it, we, it, if we look at page thirty-one, yeah. So you've taken out the building envelope. Yeah. Um, you didn't take out appliances. Uh, not for the, that small amount, no. Okay. If you replace one appliance or one or two appliances. Um, you know, within a 72-unit building. If you replace them all, I would agree that that's not an ongoing recurring expense. Well, what but about the $26,000? That, that, you know what, I look at that as well, Mr. Lucky, and you've got a point. <coughs> Thank you. You'd like to win one once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go on that. I think a portion of that would be considered under repair and maintenance. But, well, I mean, there's twenty six thousand in the repair and maintenance. They do floor. So they will do some, but but again, uh, Mr. Lucky, we're talking about what's recurring versus what you would expect as an ongoing um, stabilized expense. And I would agree with you, twenty six thousand seven hundred dollars as an ongoing year in year out expense for flooring seems a little high. So did you take that. out water damage? Uh, water damage, I did not. No. So, water damage is peculiar. Yeah, it's not on any of the other ones. Yeah, I'm yeah. Thinking that might relate to the roofing or the water tanks yeah. going. Yeah. Could that be picking up? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, then on, the, on page 43, I guess the same kind of things. Appliances at three thousand debatable. I, I don't agree with three thousand dollar expense because again, Mr. Lucky and couple exactly on a seventy two unit building, that's a recurring expense, but we took out sidewalk obviously. We took out water tanks and then and, fifteen thousand and, and the flooring, so again I'm not I wouldn't agree that it should be zero because you're always going to be replacing some some of it and that's ongoing, but here we're at the lower end versus the year prior at thirty four thousand. And the one that you alluded to at I think 20, 26,000. So the 26 and the 34, I would not expect would be. But we don't have the breakdown of the RM that would show us what, uh, what, what amount of flooring, for instance, was right. in there. No, we don't. Okay. So then furnaces at 8,000. I, I definitely that included that as no, I included that as RM. Absolutely. Yeah. Other sidewalks. Sidewalks we took out, yeah. Hot water tanks. We okay. Took yeah. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. I was just curious. How can we keep on having water tanks change all the time? I mean, every. It, it's like, so it seems like all, presuming that all of those water tanks were installed at that point and now they're all reaching the end of their life. So it's kind of like they're do, having to do it, a lot of them, each and every year. Um, so uh, I know that, you know, for a hot water tank, if it's got a life of between, well, between 10 years or maybe 15 years, and once they start to go, uh, they tend to all go at the same time, and uh, it's that appears to be what's happening. But that's speculation on my part. Would the water damage not be covered by insurance? It should be. Yeah, and as Mr. Lucky's, I, I concede Mr. Lucky's point that if the eight thousand water damage should not be included in that, right. I would agree with that. Yeah. So, what change would that make? To your well, if you added, if you took out the eight thousand, which is from the twenty seventeen year, that takes so that takes the reserve fund average down. Yeah, I'll just calculate that average. We calculate that average. So the average, uh, three-year average would be reduced to 38,686. 
And which then adds to that NOI So our revised NOI would be 390476. Should be an indicated value of 6,791. So if the stabilized average on the reserve fund would go down to 38,686. So the indicated, that then brings up the NOI to 390,476. And then capped at five and three quarter. 6,791,000 rounded. and the replacement reserve fund. I see on your repair and maintenance you're at $1,536 for sweet. Okay. Oh, based on the 110, yes, yeah. yeah. Okay, is that correct? Now, I had worked 579 prior to your adjustment, so it's not the same amount anymore, but going with what I have read, we were look, I was looking at 2,115, which could be repaired maintenance and uh, replacement reserve, but that's changed a bit now. So, I know we had heard evidence that when the rents are a little lower, repair and maintenance should normally be a bit lower. Um, so, so your new figure now is 38,686 on the uh, replacement reserve fund? Yes. Sir. Could you take me back to your page 40, not 43, 31. Yeah, you're yeah. yeah. So what did you you struck out the eighty nine seventy three? Yes. And the twenty five six ninety? Uh the twenty five six ninety was out, out originally, yeah. And then and the eighty nine seventy three now and the sixty two twenty five. What was what? Yeah, the water tanks. The water tanks. Okay. Yeah. Those three were taken out of that seventy six to come up with your new figure. Yes. Okay, that's all I had, uh, Madam Chair. Oh, so excuse me. Um, thank you. Uh, I have no questions. I thought uh, we were uh, discounting the uh, twenty-six thousand. I'm agreeing with you, Mr. Lucky. That twenty-six thousand as a single year's expense seems high. Uh, it varies from fifteen thousand up to as high as thirty-four. So I'm agreeing an adjustment should the twenty six thousand seven hundred is high, but I, I didn't make a statement about what, what should be adjusted to. Thank you. So what does that? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Well, I'm not sure. Well, I'm leaving it with the board. So okay. So uh, if Let's we go, make sure we got our yeah, right So here. if we go to page thirty one, mm -hmm. and this will be focused on the flooring now. If year in and year out, there's going to be, uh, my submission is year in and year out, you're going to have flooring expenses, replacing flooring as tenants move out and turnover and such. But what I'm agreeing with Mr. Lucky, he identified, I think, properly, 26700 seems like a, a high uh, expense to, to be included in a repair and So if you look, uh, you've got 26700 and you've got 18603 And then if you turn briefly to page 43, then in 2015, it goes down quite a bit to 15,000, uh, the very last page. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in, in 2015, it's as low as 15,343, but then in 14, it was higher again at 34,415. 
I'm agreeing that 26,700 is on the high side. Now, mathematically, um, you know, if you average those four years out, you would get something. I would, in fact, I can do that right now. Yeah. 26,700 plus 1863 So the average of the four years is actually 23,765. I'm suggesting, I guess I would, I would not object to, uh, you know, something in the, in the 20,000 range that's a bit lower still. Um, Given the four over the four years, it, it has fluctuated significantly, and and so you know that's a, that's a further deduction of about sixty sixty seven hundred dollars uh, so over that reserve fund. So going back to so if I add that, I'll just quickly add that in. That's a, that's a good point. Back to page page eight. Page eight. So let's do this. So the, if you recall, Madam Chair, the previous adjusted NOI was three ninety four seventy six. Yes. So three ninety four seventy six. Um, minus, and I'm just going to stabilize it. Sorry, that's not right. I got it. 390. So revised NOA again, it's 397, 176, and then capped at 575. Six million nine, yeah, six million nine oh seven. Okay. Thank you. Taylor, hey, could you give me a sec, please? Yes, sir. Sure. Seven three two two as the expenditure for the year, yeah. and I remove uh, the building envelope, the uh, water damage, and the water tank. I come up to thirty six four thirty four, which is a different figure than what you had. Well, it is because, and, and that's where I didn't take out in the original calculation. I didn't take out the water damage. That should be taken out. I, yeah. I completely agree. Yeah, so I so I come up with thirty six four thirty four, and now we've done a further adjustment of uh, on the on the uh, uh, flooring. Yeah, sixty seven hundred. So we've so I got sixty seven hundred to take out of that. So that's forty three one thirty four. Yeah. yeah. No, this is coming off and this is coming oh, off. Okay. Oh, okay, I know what I'm doing, I think. I, I'm sure I'll sort it out after. I I'm, I'm just want to make sure that I've got this right. Because uh, when we move around figures like that, it gets a little tricky. So I've got 36,434 plus 6,700. That's got to come out of. Yeah, but the, I use this figure of 67. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, did I miss something here? Because you're averaging it out after. That's where maybe it gets a little tricky, yeah. Because your, your new NOI is 397, 397 what? 397, 397, 397, 397, 397, 397, 397, 397, 397, 
reserve fund and the rest. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Number six. And then the next property is 100 Wickham Road. Mr. Lucky, please proceed when you are ready. Thank you. Uh, 100 Wickham Road. File number 19-3157. Roll number 060202253300. We have a townhouse uh, project. Uh, there's nine buildings, uh, two stories. This property was built in 1969 with 62 units. Uh, here's an overhead. Uh, this is in the Windsor Park area, close to Elizabeth, between uh, Archibald and uh, Lajimoti. Um, um, the best picture I can get. Uh, Sales, uh, the returns are all up to date. Uh, uh, page three, we have uh, a breakdown again. Uh, this is just really for our information the, uh, the class code, uh, or I should say the class and liability is uh, 10 is four units or less and taxable, and 20 more than four units. Uh, they're both portioned the same. Uh, value the same. Um, anyway, uh, we're, um, there's 58 three bedrooms, four, two, or four, four bedrooms, and uh, our, our NOI is about uh, 27,000 lower than the applicants. Uh, so the, um, Total assessment is eight million four hundred ninety-six, which is about one hundred thirty-seven thousand per unit. Um, I think that's all I have. What else do you maintain yourself? Thank you very much, Mr. Reimer. Do you have questions from Mr. Reimer? Sure. Um, again, I'm model driven as I understand it. Top of the line. I expect. Yes, I would appear, would appear that way. And uh, Madam Chair, questions asked and answered on Capri, if I could please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Phil. No questions. Mr. Terry? No questions. Thank you. All right, Mr. Reimer. Take your seat. Page 8, please. Of our evidence and sheets. And Mr. Lucky has characterized it exactly right. If you go skip down to line 33, our NOI is in fact $27,000 higher than the model driven NOI. So, again, for the same reasons we talked about earlier, this comes down to cap rate with this 1969 building, and we're asking for a 6% rate based on our slightly higher NOI, and that request then comes in at $7,000,000. 954,000 rounded, and that's our request this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lucky, any questions? Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you all very much. And Thank now you. 
closed this hearing. Thank you.